Hey, welcome to Emmanuel, everyone. We're so happy that you're here with us this morning. This is your chance to stand up and sing these great songs out to this great God of ours. Sing it with us. Lift your head, weary sinner. The river's just ahead. Down the path of forgiveness, salvation's waiting there. You build a mighty fortress, 10,000 burdens high. Love is here to lift you up, here to lift you high. your eyes on the mountain let the past be dead and gone come on saints and sinners you can outrun God whatever you've done can overcome the power of the blood if your love stand wondering come stumbling in like a prodigal toss Let the change. 
shines for all to see. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise to Christ our King. The fear that held us now gives way to him who is our peace. His final grace
Good morning. Can we just praise the God who is alive and has defeated the grave? I want to welcome you all here to Emmanuel, especially if you are a first or second time guest with us. And if you are, I would love for you to fill out our connection card. And you can find that either in the chair in front of you or in your handout. And if you take a moment to fill that out, we're going to send you some more information about our church. And if you're a second time guest with us, we just want to say thank you for coming back. And we're going to give you a free Chick-fil-A milkshake coupon. Now, parents, I have a big announcement for you. There is going to be our Spring Hill camp coming up here in just a couple of days. It's going to be June 13th to the 17th. And any kid who has completed kindergarten through the fourth grade is going to be able to go. And it's going to be here at our Greenwood campus. And it's going to be tons of fun for the kids. There's going to be small group Bible studies, engaging large group sessions, and tons of activities like bungee jumping on trampolines, archery, tie-dye t-shirts, camp songs. It's going to be tons of fun. You should totally sign your kids up. And here's the best part. Your kids are going to be away for the day learning about Jesus. And then you get to have that time to yourself. What could be better? So right there, sign your kids up. There's going to be limited spots, and you can sign up either at eclife.org, or there are going to be people back in our children's ministry right now wearing a Spring Hill t-shirt, and they can also get you signed up for that. Now, I'd like to just take a moment and share with you some encouraging news that we have seen here in just the last month, and that is that in the month so far at our three campuses, we have seen 107 people come to Christ. And that brings our total to 500 people this whole year who have created a brand new relationship with Jesus Christ. Can we just give it to God one more time? That is amazing. And we want to thank everyone who gives to this church financially because we are able to create an environment like our church and other places around the world where we can not only have people come to Christ, but to grow in Christ. And if you haven't made that decision yet to give financially, we make it really easy here at Emmanuel. And you can give right now as our offering comes around. Or you can see up here on the screen all the different options that you have. Now will you join me as I pray for our offering. Dear God, I want to thank you for bringing us all here this morning. And I pray that you would help everyone to realize that this money is going to be able to help and change people's lives. And possibly build a brand new relationship with you. And I pray that you would help us to be responsible with this money to go out and show your love throughout the world. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, what is up, Emmanuel? How are you today? You all look pretty good. It's exciting to, to be here with you today. We are in a series called Go First. First time we've ever done a series on leadership ever since I've been the pastor here at the church. And so it's a little bit exciting. Last week, Matt got us off to a great start. If you weren't at the race, you were here. And so uh, if, did you enjoy Matt last week? Did he do a good job? Awesome, those of you who were here. Um, yeah, so he got us off, off to a great start last week, and I'm just going to kind of piggyback on what he said. And, uh, you know, I, I came across a tweet last week that I thought was pretty funny, and uh, I would put their picture up here and put the tweet up here, but it's actually somebody that comes to our church, so I won't do that. Um, but the tweet said this, is it okay to pop your ear phones in and watch Grey's Anatomy during church? And I have to tell you... You know, being the speaker up here uh, most of the time, I was a little bit, uh, I wasn't so excited about that tweet, but it did tickle me a little bit. And of course, I tweeted back. I said, no, pay attention. Your pastor's following you on Twitter. No, I didn't, I didn't do that. <laughs> you never know. I could be following you. So watch what you say about the church. Anyway, um, I, I, I thought about that idea, and I said to myself, you know, people could be tempted to do that during this series. Go first, the series on leadership. You could be tempted because uh, to, to take your earphones and plug them in and watch Sports Center or Netflix or whatever it is that you maybe you like raising out of you. I don't know. Because the idea of leadership tends to be this, this, this concept that, yeah, it doesn't really apply to me. I mean, I'm not a leader. I've got a boss at work. I've, you know, I'm not the leader in my home. <laughs> a lot of husbands will say that sometimes. Anyway, um, you know, just it doesn't really apply to me. And, and, and the temptation would be to check out. I totally understand that. I remember when I was a college student at Liberty University. Liberty would bring all these big-time speakers in, you know, to, to, you know, that were successful in business or successful in ministry. And one time they brought in this guy named John Maxwell. And you know, I didn't know who he was at that point in my life, but he was a leadership guru. He had written all these books on leadership. And it was like, you know, the cream of the crop when it comes to leadership. And, and he was supposed to speak all week long in, in convocation or whatever in, in that environment. You know, I skipped all of those talks. <laughs> I didn't go to any of them because I thought, leadership leadership. I'm not a leader. I just want to get a, a wife and pass my classes and, and maybe go to the weight room and lift some weights or something. But I wasn't concerned about, about being a leader at all. So I just want to help you understand. I understand that this, this might be one of those series where you want to check out and watch whatever on your phone or whatever because we have good Wi-Fi here at the church. Anyway, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, really pay attention. Here's why. A couple reasons. Nothing ever changes for the better without leadership. Like this is the way the world works. Like, if things are going to change in your world, in our world, in, our, in the, the community that we live in, it's going to take leadership. Like, think about it. Germany would have taken over the world without some leaders stepping up and stopping Hitler. Do you agree with this? Like, this country, the United States of America, wouldn't even exist. We wouldn't even be sitting here if it wasn't for leaders who step up and said, you know, we're going to do something different. There, there'd be no civil rights movement without a leader who stepped up or many leaders who stepped up and said, it's not right. It has, things have to change in this country. Nothing ever changes for the better without leadership. And guess what? Last week, Matt said it perfectly. He said, you are a leader because you have this thing called influence. And so every single one of you are a leader because at some level, and some of us have more influence than others, but you definitely have some level of influence in your life, even if it's just within your home or even it's just, if it's just within your own person. You have influence over yourself. So please don't check out. Now, if you're still thinking, oh, man, I'm not a leader. I can't really make a difference. I want to share a story with you from a book called The Truth About Leadership by some leadership experts who actually wrote another book called The Leadership Challenge. James Cousins and Barry Posner, or Posner, I don't know how you say his last name, but they share this story about a fourth grade girl named Melissa. Incredible story. I'll just share the quick version of it, of it with you. She's in the fourth grade. She watches a, a television program on pollution, and she suddenly gets a burden for her community. Remember last week, Matt talked about you, a leader has to have a burden. We looked at the story of Nehemiah. And she got this burden that she didn't want to grow up in a world that was filled with pollution. So that night, she wrote a letter to the first President Bush. This is back in 1989. And of course, you know, 
uh, weeks go by and, and Bush doesn't respond and, you know, at all. And, and so she starts to take it upon herself because that's what a leader does. A leader takes ownership. They don't say, hey, there's a problem. Somebody else is going to solve it. No, they start to do things. So she starts to recycle and turn lights off and turn water off. And she starts to write letters to her local Congress people. And she called the local television uh, program uh, a network there in her neighborhood. And she got on television talking about the, this, this problem of pollution. And one thing led to another. She ended up starting an organization as a fourth grader called Kids Face, Kids for a Cleaner Environment. It started to explode, and, 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 and at one point, she wanted the president to see her letter so bad that she started calling billboard companies because she thought in her fourth grade mind that if the letter was really big, then maybe the president would see it. And so these billboard companies started working with each other, and this is amazing. Over 250 billboards were, were uh, published her letter, one in every state of the United States, and one billboard published her letter, full-size letter, a mile from the White House. This is a fourth great girl. You talk about leadership, right? This girl is getting it done. Well, of course, she eventually gets a form letter from the president because he can't deny it at this point, but it wasn't a personal letter. But she didn't need his influence at that point because hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of kids wanted to join her organization. And today there are 500,000 kids that are part of Kids Space. They have this manual that they put together on all these different ideas and how to clean up the environment. They had this one, one in a million day where one million kids were going to plant one million trees by the year, by a certain year. And unbelievable stuff that took place. She eventually ended up on the Today Show because all of the, the stuff that she had done. You know, we gave a definition of leadership last week. Said that, we said this, leadership is this simple idea of using your influence to rally others to achieve something you can't do alone. Melissa, this fourth grade girl, did amazing things because she rallied other people. She used her influence, what little influence she had, to get other people to accomplish something she could not do alone. Now, if a, fourth, if a fourth grader can do that, what do you think you can do? I want you to repeat, w- repeat something after me right now. I want you to say this. I want you to say, I am a leader. I want you to say that. Let's be ready. I am a leader. Now, with a little bit more enthusiasm and with a little bit more energy. I am a leader. Again, ready? I am a leader. You're a leader because you have influence. If she, if she can pull off that kind of difference, what can God do through you. You know, last week Matt talked about this idea of a burden. He talked about owning it, and then he talked about acting with love. That's great stuff to get us launched into this series. Today what I want to do is talk to you about the leader's attitude, the leader's mindset. Every single leader has to have a certain mindset in order to lead well. And here's the mindset. Ready? The leader must be, say it with me, optimistic. They must be a glass half full type of person. They can't be a glass half empty type of person. Who follows a negative leader? Anybody? Who follows like an Eeyore type of leader? Oh, it's not going to work. We'll never reach our goals. You know, it'll never get fixed. I have no solutions. Your ideas won't work. Mine won't work either. Like you can't lead anything with a, with a pessimistic attitude. In fact, there's a great story in the Bible that illustrates this. It's the story of, the, of how the Egyptians came up out of Egypt and God promised them that they were going to go into the promised land, a land that he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know anything about the Bible? Those are the big patriarchs there. And, 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 this, and the story I want to look at today is, is they're, they're, the Israelites are in this middle ground. They're, they're not in slavery anymore, but they're not in the promised land either. And as they're getting ready to go into the promised land, God says, here's what I want you to do. Moses, I want you to choose 12 leaders to go into the promised land and, and kind of spy it out and kind of figure out how you're going to take it. Not, not if you can take it. This is not a, this is not a can we mission. This is a, a how to mission, right? So, so sure enough, Moses chooses these 12 leaders and they go in and they spy out the land for 40 days and they check it out and all this stuff. And then they come back to give Moses and all the people a report. And I want you to see what they say. Watch this. This is what the leaders say. We entered the land and set, that you sent us into explore, and it indeed is a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey, and here's some of the fruit that it had, you know, comes from it, and they held up some grapes or bananas or whatever, whatever it was, and, and this is what they say. But the people living there are, say it with me, powerful, and their towns are, say it with me, large and fortified, and we even saw giants there. Uh-oh. You could begin to feel the fear 
inside of them, right? The fear in the leaders. So, so two out of the 12 leaders, they notice that things are going south pretty quickly, okay? They're like, the morale is shifting here. And so they jump in, and this is what Joshua and Caleb say. Notice how we, we have boys named Joshua and Caleb. There's a reason for that because of this story. Watch, watch Josh and Caleb. Let's go up at once and take the land. We, say with me, we can certainly conquer it. Notice the optimism there. They say, oh, whoa, 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 time out. Don't let, let's not let this whole thing shift to the, you know, go south. And we can do this. But watch what the 10 leaders, the 10 pessimistic leaders say. They quickly jump back in and say, we, say with me, we can't go up. Here's why. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report, this negative, pessimistic report about the whole land uh, throughout all the Israelites. Look, they continue. Watch this. This is what they say. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anybody. This, this Hebrew word here means to eat up, like, like to totally take and inhale a, a, a steak. <laughs> it's like you eat the whole thing. That's what the word means. I thought that would be interesting to you. But anyway, so it eats the people up who go into it. Why All the people we saw there are huge. And then they continue with this pessimistic, you know, attitude. Watch this. We even saw giants there next to them. We felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought of us too. <laughs> These guys, they, they would squish us. Like, like you'd go out and squish a cockroach or a spider or something. We're nothing compared to these guys. And, of course, everybody's listening in, and, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh. And all of a sudden, the pessimistic attitude of the leaders spread to everybody. In your notes, this is the way I wrote it. The pessimism of the leaders spread to all the people. Of course it did. Why? Because that's the nature of leadership. That's what happens. You, people look to their leader for the attitude, for the mindset, and they say, well, what does he think? Well, what does she think? Do they think we can do it? Does she think we can do it? And if not, well, I'm not, I'm not going to go and try if our leader doesn't even think we can do it. And all of a sudden, the negative attitude spread. The fear, the fear triggered pessimism, and the pessimism started to spread. Doesn't it work this way in your house? Those of you who have children <laughs> or grandchildren. Many of you know that my wife and I, we try to go on a, a, a vacation once a year to a beach somewhere. And uh, I love that. We bring books and we relax. And, but I never get in the water. Does anybody know why I don't get in the water? Some of you have been around. You know why I don't get in the water. Because there's sharks in the water. Of course there are. You're never, you're, never further, uh, you're never further away than 100 yards from a shark, right? So there may be a little shark, but it's a shark. <laughs> and so I don't, there's no need. Plus, when you get out, you're sticky with salt. It's just, ugh. you know, there's a, a pool close by, right? You could go into if you're hot. So I don't get in the water. And we, and so we talk about that in our house. And, you know, we talk about, we watch Shark Week. Anybody else watch Shark Week? Yeah, it's, it's good stuff. It's good program, good program, good wholesome programming. And so we watch that in our house, and we talk about the water, and we talk about how there's sharks in the water. And, you know, when, when they do these recreations of a shark bite, we, we, we pause it, and we get everybody and say, watch this, watch this shark. And we you know, the shark gets the guy in the leg, and there's blood in the water and everything. And, and you know, some people get their calves bit off because the sharks that, and some people get their butts bit off. We saw one one time. I'm not serious. <laughs> serious, like she was just floating in a raft. The thing came up, just took her butt right off. I kid you not. So that, that, that episode, I, started, I looked at my kids and said, guys, I don't know about you, but I like my butt. I like it. I want to keep it. And the boys started saying, we do too, Dad. It's like, don't go in the water. That's real simple. Keep your butt. Don't go in the ocean. See it? I mean, it all, this is wisdom. This is, this is discernment. It's gotten to the point now where one of my children is, 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 has, has taken it to the next level where they're just afraid to even watch, like, Jaws. Like, not that you should show your, your, your fifth or sixth graders Jaws, but, you know, it's a good movie. Um, and, there, you know, the other day I was at the movies with my son. I think I told you a couple weeks ago we were watching the Avengers, the new Avengers movie. And, and you know, it's a great, great action-packed, you know, Civil War thing, whatever. But before the movie started, they did a little 45-second trailer of a new movie about a shark. Did you see that? Have you heard about this? It's a girl, and, 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 and the shark looks like worse than Jaws. I mean, wow. And, you know, just 45 seconds, and the girl's trying to get away, and there's just, a guy gets eaten, and, and it's just like, the, and, and, and my, I look over my son, he's like, oh. You know, he's just, he can't even watch. So then we watched the whole movie. Well, then, it was a great movie, action pack. On the way out of the theater, I mean, I, we didn't even get out of the theater. My son looks at me. I say, hey, how was the movie? Why did they have to show that, that, that coming attraction about the shark? I'm like, what? You're still thinking about that? Like, that's like, like the negative attitude of the leader has infiltrated the followers. I'm not kidding. It's, it's unbelievable how that works. Listen, 
Listen to how the, ten, the, t- the negative pessimistic attitude affects all of the people of Israel. Watch this. This is, this is not so funny. This is what they say after hearing the guys. Why is, it the, why is it that the Lord is taking us into this country only to have us die in battle? The people of Israel start to connect the dots in different ways because of fear, because of pessimism. And they, they actually come to a wrong belief about God because of the negative perspective of the leader. Whoa. Parents, pay attention really quick. Your children may come to an inaccurate view or belief about God because of your negative, pessimistic attitude about life. That's what happens. Talk about the power of perspective. God wasn't taking them into the promised land to kill them. They're saying that God is the one that's going to kill them in the wilderness. God is the one who wants to deliver them into the promised land. He's the one who parted the Red Sea so they can walk around, walk through on dry ground. He's not trying to kill them. He's trying to deliver them into a, and give them a gift. Listen, they continue. Our wives and our little ones are going to be carried off into plunder. And that's what fear does to us. It, it, we start to imagine the worst case scenario, and then we, we believe it, that it's going to happen, and, and, it, and it, it just totally it becomes a reality in our life. Where did, where did this irrational fear come from? The negative attitude of the leaders. And they say this, watch this. Wouldn't it have been better for us to return to Egypt? So they come up with this great <laughs> plan. Watch what they say. Then they plotted among themselves, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. What a stupid idea. They just came out of Egypt. Let, let me remind you, when, when, when the children of Israel walked through on dry ground in the Red Sea, the soldiers, the, the Egyptian army followed them through, and God closed the water in. Egypt had no more army. <laughs> you think Pharaoh was happy about that? Let me remind you that the firstborn son of every Egyptian family had just been taken out by the death angel. Do you think think that Pharaoh and all the Egyptians would have welcomed the Israelites back? Oh, you're back. You killed all of our sons and we have no army. Welcome back. Oh, by the way, you took all of our gold and silver. We're so excited to have you back. They, this, is, this is madness. The, 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 the Israelites would rather go back to a place that was uh, totally destroyed and annihilated than face the giants in the promised land. This is what, this is, the, this is the result of a negative mindset of the leaders. It's incredible. So Joshua and, Joshua and Caleb, because they're optimists, they try to jump in, but it's too late because this, this fear has just infected and spread like cancer, you know, or smallpox or something like that. It's just infected everybody. And so then the people, after Joshua and Caleb try to step up, the people start to talk about killing Joshua and Caleb. They're like, look, we got to kill these guys. We need a new leader. They keep talking about going in this promised land, so they start to, you know, talk about getting stones and stoning Joshua and Caleb. And, and that's when things shift. <laughs> that's when things shift. I don't know what kind of home you grew up in, but I grew up in a home that was really active. My brothers and I were all, uh, were all back to back to back, so I'm 38, Jason's 39, and my other brother's 40. So we were real close. Three of us were in diapers, and so we gave my mom a very very challenging time. If you can imagine, three little boys in diapers, and, and then we got older together as well. And so from time to time, we would push her over the edge. You know what I'm talking about, moms? Like when you like lose your mind and you start doing things you think you'd never do. Yeah, 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 yeah. That happened in our house after we broke a bunch of stuff in my mom's living room. Anyway, lots of stories there. So from time to time, it would get so bad and the fighting and the sports and the balls or whatever would get so so chaotic. My mom would say this, you wait till your father gets home. I've had enough. And, you know, when she said that, we all knew what that meant. Because my dad was one of those dads that would step in and take his belt off. You know what I'm talking about? And then he would go, whoosh, whoosh. And when you hear that sound, if you ever had a dad like that, you know, that that just, you you just start shaking to death. Because you know the next thing that happens is that sound is going to be, it's going to be maybe made on this thing right here. And now, that was only extreme cases, but that would happen. And so sometimes my dad, you know, my mom would say, you know, you wait till your father gets home. Let me tell you what happened in this story. In this story, ready? Dad came home. In our story here. He came home, and he took off his belt, and he was ready to whip whip some (laughs) you-know-what. He was not happy at all. Listen to what happens. Then the glorious presence of daddy appeared <laughs> to all the Israelites in the tabernacle. I mean, you imagine what this must have looked like. I mean, everyone saw the presence of God. What was that like? It doesn't describe it, but can I, I can only imagine. It's like, everybody said, whoa, oh my gosh, God's, God's here. 
And everybody sat down. Watch what God says next to Moses. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they despise me? How long will they reject me? How long will they disobey me? He continues, watch this. Will they never believe me? Believe what? What what, what was the problem here? The Israelites were not believing that God could do the impossible, that God could part the Red Sea, that he could bring down hailstones, that he could turn water into blood, all the rivers in Egypt, that he could do the miraculous. Will they not believe that when I'm on your side, I can deliver you into the promised land? I can overcome those giants. They are nothing to me. Will they never believe me? Even after all the miraculous signs I've done among them, he says, look, I've had it. I'm done with them. I will disown them, and I will destroy them with a plague. (laughs) So because of this, Moses has to jump in and save the day. Moses. Moses had this this leverage with God. I don't, perhaps no one in the world has ever had, maybe other than Jesus. But Moses jumps in and says, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm paraphrasing now. Whoa, 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 whoa. If you wipe all of your, if you kill everybody, if you disown them, if you wipe them all out with a plague, Egypt is going to hear about it. Egypt's going to think, well, the, that you were not powerful enough to, li- to deliver your people into the promised land. Please show your loving kindness, show your mercy, and then, and then take your people into the promised land so that everyone will know that how powerful you are. And Moses makes this articulate argument to God. And guess what happens? It's unbelievable. And, and, and maybe you can apply this to your prayer life. God changes his mind. He says, okay, Moses, I'll listen to you. I won't wipe everybody out, but I won't totally let it go either. And so then God begins to share what he's going to do, and he says, basically, everybody uh, is going to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years, not going to go into the promised land. One year for every day the spies spied out the land, 40 years. Okay, so we're going to take a break. I'm not going to give you the land yet. And everyone who is 20 years and above is going to die in the wilderness, Everyone who's an adult. And the kids that you thought that were going to be, you know, kidnapped and turned into plunder, those children, they will take the promised land in your place, but you will never see it if you're 20 years and older. Now, we're not talking about hundreds of people. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. We're going to die in the wilderness. And God says, as you walk through the, the wilderness for 40 years, you will know what it is like to have me as your enemy. And then the 10 guys, the 10 leaders that gave this bad report and caused all this, they were done. Poor guys. They died, with, they died in the plague. God, God didn't even let them wander through the wilderness. He just killed them. Listen, any theology that doesn't include the discipline of God is an incomplete theology. We talk a lot about love and mercy, and God is love, and God is very merciful, but any theology that does not include the discipline of God is an incomplete theology. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 12. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, he loves, and he punishes everyone he accept as, accepts as a child. God is a merciful God, but when we just kind of put him to the test, 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 disobey, disbelieve, disobey, disbelieve, eventually he says, okay, we've got to come in and, and take some corrective action. Now, thank you, thankfully, he does that because he loves us, not because he hates us. Is anybody excited about that? <laughs> I'm excited about that. It's because of his love. Now, here's what I want you to get today if you get nothing else. This is so important. This is really the whole point of my talk today. It's in your notes there. The perspective of the leader. It's the leader's perspective that caused an entire generation to miss God's destination. Please please get this. This is the power of the perspective of a leader. It was the 10 leaders. It was their mindset. It was their disbelief. It was their fear that caused an entire generation of people to miss God's destination. God wanted to take all of these people into the promised land, and everyone who was 20 and above did not make it. Why? Because of the perspective of the leader. They gave in to fear. Their pessimism was rooted in fear. These giants, they're too big. These, the walls around the cities, they're too big. We can't do it. These people are more powerful than us. Apply that to your own life. What will the people who are following you in your life It could just be your children. It could be the people at work. What will they not experience because of your negative attitude? Where will they not go because of your pessimistic attitude? Where will they not, what will they not experience because of your fear in life? See, if you want to be a leader, you must be optimistic. What would have happened if, (laughs) it's amazing, what would have happened if 10 out of the 12 
leaders would have come back and said, you're not going to believe this. This land, look at the fruit. It's unbelievable. Milk, honey. Yeah, there's some people in there, but, but you know, they're nothing compared to what God just did to the Egyptians. I mean, the Red Sea thing and the, and the Ten Plagues thing. I mean, let's go right now. What would have happened if, they, if 10 out of the 12 would have said that? Guess what would have happened? They would have, it would have taken them 11 days to start taking the first city. Because that's how far it was from where they were to where the first city was. 11 days. Instead of it taking 11 days, it took 40 years. <sighs> Talk about how important the perspective of the leader is. It must be optimistic. So here, here's what I want to close with. I want to answer this question. Where, where, where does the leader's optimism come from? I mean, we just, do we muster it up? You know, do we listen to some happy music? <laughs> do we wake up and just kind of say, you know, get with it, get with the program, be happy? Like, we're, like how, do we, how do we create optimism? Where does it come from? What is it rooted in? That's such a good question, don't you think? I'm so glad you were wondering the same thing. Watch this. The leader's optimism is rooted in God's ability, not his or her own ability. That is so important. It's not like Joshua and Caleb were like, let's go up right now because here's the thing. We've got all this experience in war and with swords and, and, and military experience. We're great soldiers, and Moses is a great leader, and we're great leaders. We can take these giants. We can take these cities because we rock. <laughs> it wasn't like that. They were slaves. They had just come out of slavery for 400 years. They didn't know how to fight. They weren't military leaders, yet they had all this optimism. Let's go up at once and take the cities. We can do it. Where did it come from? It didn't come from their own, from their own abilities or the abilities of, a, of some type of military force. They weren't. They were a bunch of slaves. Where did it come from? It was rooted in God's ability. See, Joshua and Caleb knew and experienced what God had just done. They didn't forget. They knew that with God on their side, amazing things can happen. Miraculous things can happen. They knew that God was fighting for them. Listen to what they said in chapter 14 before they almost got killed with stones. They tried to plead with the people. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into the land and give it to us. He's the one that we're not going to do this. This is what God wants to do. He's going to make sure that we take this land. Look, they continue. Watch this argument they make. It's fantastic. Do not rebel against the Lord, and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are helpless prey to us. What a different perspective. The, the, the ten leaders are going, these guys are huge. They're giants. We look like grasshoppers in their sight. They can smush us like insects. Not Joshua and Caleb. These guys are helpless prey to us. How could they say that? Watch, watch this. Here's the answer, next verse. They have no protection. Here's why. The Lord is, say it with me, with us. The God is with us. The God who created the universe. The God who parted the Red Sea. The God who brought down the ten plagues. The God, this God can do anything. Guess what? He's fighting for us. Therefore, therefore, don't be afraid of them. Don't cave in to fear. Don't listen to the ten leaders who gave the negative report. Our confidence and our optimism is rooted in God. Come on, guys, let's go, let's go, let's go. And of course, they didn't listen. And they had to go do the 40 years. But now we get to learn from their story. And here we sit, and you're a leader. And nothing great ever gets done apart from leadership. And you have influence. And you have a choice. You have a choice to step into your role as a leader and be negative. And woe is me, and we can't, and... Here's why, and people are big, and challenges are too strong, and I can make that same list too. Or we can say, you know what? Here's what God's going to do. He's going to fight for us. We can do it. Not because we're great. Not because we've got a great army. Because God is a God who does the miraculous. Here, here at this church, I kid you not, this is the story of our church. Like right now, we're trying to build this third site. We're looking at property. We're trying to do things we've never done before. We're trying to use our influence to rally a bunch of people to accomplish a task that we can't do alone. It's exactly what's happening. It's not like I can say, hey, you know what? I know what to do because I've led a church of, uh, with 10 multi-sites before, so here's the next step. Here's what you need to do. I, I've never done that before. I don't have that experience. I don't have that knowledge. Other pastors do. I don't. It's not like our elder board has all that this, this wisdom and experience because they've led multi-site churches before. No, they haven't. We're all kind of learning each month as we go forward. How do we do this? How do we do this? Where's our optimism going to come from? I tell you one place, God's ability, not ours. Here's what Jesus said before he went back to heaven after he rose from the dead. He said, guys, 
I want you to go into the entire world and I want you to make followers, students, apprentices, disciples of all nations. And I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I want you to teach them everything that I've taught you and observe all that stuff and obey the teachings. And then he closes with this little phrase. He says, and guys, I will be with you to the end of the age. Does that sound familiar? I will be with you. It's what Jesus said to his disciples as he left. I will be with you to the end. Your confidence is going to come from the reality that my presence is with you. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. And so as a, as a pastor, I say, guys, this is what Jesus wants to do. He wants us to make disciples. Who make disciples? Who make disciples? We're going to figure this out because God is with us. The leader's optimism is rooted in God's ability, not his or her own. Let me ask you this question. What would happen in your life? What would happen in your life if you stepped into your role as an optimistic leader? What would happen? You, in your, in your little area, wherever it is you lead, maybe you have a larger area, maybe it's a company, maybe it's a classroom, I don't know, I don't know where you lead. Maybe you're on the police force, maybe you're in government, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe you're just a stay-at-home parent, I'm not sure. But what would happen if you stepped into your role as an optimistic leader? Here's what I believe would happen. Something God-exalting and Christ-honoring, something miraculous would happen. How can, you, how can you say that? Here's how. Because after the 40 years were over, Joshua and Caleb, they were still optimistic because they still believed in, God, in God's ability. They, they took the people of Israel, and when they got to the first city of Jericho, guess what happened? God told them, walk around the city once every day for six days, and on the seventh day, walk around the city seven times, and then blow a bunch of horns and scream at the top of your lungs. So, it's a pretty good, uh, you know, uh, battle plan, don't you think? It's pretty strange. But when God is on your side, you kind of do what he says, and then you watch him do the miraculous. So that's what they did. And on the seventh day, they walked around the city seven times. They blew the horn. You could read the story later, Joshua chapter 7. And the stinking walls fell down. <laughs> the walls around, around Jericho, they just fell over. And then the people of Israel went in and they took the city. Like, this is what happens when you have a, when you have a, a leader that trusts in God. Like, God fights for them and miraculous things happen. What would happen in your life if you stepped into your role as an optimistic leader? I think something miraculous, something Christ-exalting. God honoring would take place in your life. Leadership begins with a burden. You have to own it. You have to act in love, and then you have to bring optimism to the table. Now, let me close by talking about <laughs> our God who does the miraculous. You know, when it comes to the greatest miracle of all time, it wasn't the walls of Jericho. It wasn't even the Red Sea, although those were awesome. It wasn't even the things that Jesus did with, with a blind man or, or a leper or, or people who were lame and couldn't walk. Those are cool. The greatest miracle that ever took place is found in the message of the gospel. See, here's the reality. You and I were born into this world. Pay attention, please. Pay attention. You and I were born into this world dead in trespasses and sins. That's how the Bible describes us. That literally means, have you ever seen a dead person do anything? No, because they're dead. They don't breathe. They don't move. They don't eat. They don't nothing. They're dead. Spiritually, we are born into this world dead in trespass. What does that mean? That means we cannot reach out to God and solve our spiritual problems. And because of that, God reached out to us in Christ. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Christ comes into this world to deal with our spiritual depravity, the ruin of our soul. By dying on a cross, he pays the penalty for our sins. He does for us what we could not do. We couldn't pay the penalty for sin. Someone else had to do it for us. And God paid the penalty for sin by having his son die for it on the cross. And it didn't stop there. Three days later, he rose from the dead. He took his life back, conquering the penalty of sin and death. Why? Why? So that, so that the impossible could happen. So that you and God can be reunited and have a relationship. The Bible calls it eternal life and abundant life. That is the greatest miracle in the universe. Have you stepped into that? Have you asked Christ to be your savior? It's there for you if you'd like it. Eternal life is, is for those who ask. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, reach out to the Lord, will be saved. Perhaps today, perhaps today, you step into that relationship and you ask Christ to be your savior. And you receive the forgiveness of your sins and eternal life. With every eye 
closed and every head bowed. If you feel God tugging on your heart, would you step into this moment? It doesn't take a lot of faith. It just takes a little. Jesus said, is a faith as small as the grain of mustard seed. Would you reach out to him right now and ask him to forgive your sins? All you'd have to do is say something like this. Dear Jesus, I reach out to you. I believe you died on the cross. You bridged the gap between me and you. I believe you died and you rose from the dead so that I could be forgiven, cleansed, washed, and to become your child. I believe in you. I trust in you. And I thank you for providing eternal life for me. Help me from this day forward to honor you with my life. Every word, every action, may it bring a smile to your face. May I live in your grace. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer before you leave, before you leave, we're about ready to wrap up. We would love, if you prayed to receive Christ today, we would love as you walk out there, tables back here to my left and to my right if you're in the balcony, please go grab a free one-year Bible. It's our gift to you, and the reason we're so passionate about this is because as you read the Word of God, here's what it says. Your Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. What does that mean? This, the Word of God, is sort of a, a map for our life. It's the way that God talks to us, the primary way he speaks to us. We begin to learn his heart. We begin to learn his will. And so you might say, well, I already have a Bible, but you don't have one like this. <laughs> okay, this is a one-year Bible. It's broken down into little five-minute readings. I read these same passages every single day so we can be synced up. Wouldn't that be cool? Me, you, synced right here? Yeah, cool. Okay, that's a little weird. Maybe not. But, but... We want to give this to you as a gift, so, so if you pray to receive Christ, go and do that. Can we give God glory today for what he's done? As you leave, as you leave, watch this, watch this. One last thought, one last thought. You know I, I got to give you a challenge. You know that, right? One of my favorite verses in the Bible, and that, that's a lot for me to say that, okay, because there's a lot of cool verses. Second Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth, even Greenwood, Indiana. <laughs> God sees us. I know sometimes we're like, ah, I probably not. No, he does. The whole earth. In order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. This is a leadership verse. This verse is written to a king who's leading a nation. He says, look, I'm looking for a man. I'm looking for a woman. I'm looking for a fourth grader if that's who's available. Anybody who'll say, I I'll do it. I'll go. I have the burden. I'll believe in your ability, God. And when God finds that man, when God finds that woman, here's what happens. Amazing things. Watch this. I will strengthen them. I will put my miraculous power behind them. I will support them. I will knock walls down. I will do things through that person if they will just fully commit to me. If they will believe that I'm God, that I can do the miraculous. Will you be that man? Will you be that woman? Will you be that middle, school, that middle schooler, that high school student? Now the choice is up to you. I'm, I'm trying to take this. I screw it up. I blow it. <laughs> Sometimes I'm half committed. But I try every morning to say, God, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to totally surrender my heart to you. Would you do for me whatever it is you'd like to do in this world? Have your way. That's my challenge today. Let's pray. Jesus, every one of us are leaders in our own way in our own capacity. Help us. Help us to be positive. Help us to be optimistic. and Help us to, to find that optimism in your ability. God, do what you want to do through us in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, week number three of Go First. You're not going to want to miss it. Bring a friend. See you later. <laughs>